Acts chapter number 10. There are 48 verses. We're not going to read all that. Brother Tommy, we don't have time. But we are going to have to do a little bit of summarizing. Uh, at the beginning of the chapter, you'll find in verse number 1, there was a certain man of Caesarea. His name was Cornelius. Okay, Cornelius was a centurion. He was part of the Italian band. That was the company that he was assigned to. Okay, now this centurion, verse number 2 will tell you, he's a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. And, verse number 3, one day he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming unto him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? Then the Lord answered him and said, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. So, Cornelius, he's a devout man, one that feared God, worshiped God. He's praying to God. And as he's praying one day, an angel appears. Okay, he says, hey, your deeds have come up before God as a memorial. Send down to Joppa. Call for a guy named Peter. He'll show up. Okay, well, then it goes on. Gives them a little bit more instructions. Okay, then, in verse number 10, this is Peter. Okay, well, verse number 9. It says, On the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Because here we find Peter praying. Okay, and he started to get hungry in verse number 10. Okay, and while they were making the meal, in verse number 11, and he saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. For I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, thou call now, that call thou, that call not thou common. Don't know why I'm having such trouble with that. But then it says, This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. And in verse 19, while Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee, arise therefore, and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Okay? So what's going on here? Peter sees a vision. He sees a vessel descending from heaven that looked like a sheet that had been knitted together at the four corners. Well, what's that look like? Well, anybody ever see one of them goofy pictures where storks bring babies? And what's a stork always holding in its mouth? A sheet that's tied together at the four corners in its mouth. Right? Looks like a bundle, if you will. Okay? Similar thing. No, it's not real, Brother Tommy. No stork is big enough to bring you. All right? It's what you get for being sarcastic in my Sunday school lesson. But that sheet, that bundle, if you will, descends from heaven, it's got every man or four-footed beast in it. Well, what's the significance of that? Well, under the law, the Jews could not eat all of the four-footed beast. Okay, they could eat sheep, couldn't eat pig. Okay, and I mean, if you study out what nowadays they call kosher eating, you're allowed to have cheese and you're allowed to have a burger, but you can't have both of them at the same time. Weird stuff. Nowadays to us. Because later, the Apostle Paul wrote that, you know, all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. And there were instances where Paul would come in and he would eat things that normally the Jews wouldn't eat so that he wouldn't offend those that he was trying to win to the Lord. Because God explained to the Apostle Paul the same thing that he's trying to teach to Peter here, that that was the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. Now we're under grace. Right, those things were to show us that we are not perfect, that we could not be holy, but afterwards Christ fulfilled the law. We're no longer under the bondage of the law. Okay? Well, Peter, in verse number 17, you see that he doubted within himself what this vision could mean. As this vision 
showed him that bundle coming down. God said, Peter. He said, rise, Peter. Kill and eat. He said, hey, here's a, here's a buffet for you. Go and get it. But then Peter said, not so. Nope. I haven't eaten anything common or unclean in my entire life. Then God, to pay for it, but we'll just read it. That call not thou common. Well, what shouldn't we call common? What God hath cleansed. The thing that makes it okay to eat those things is that we give thanks to God that he provided it for us. God provided it. In other words, God hath cleansed it. It wasn't common anymore. It wasn't unclean anymore because God provided it to Peter. In other words, God's saying, if I arrange it to where that's what you're eating, give thanks to God for it and eat it. Don't turn your nose up at the grace of God. Right. Now that's a lesson that Peter took him, took him a little bit to get because he pondered on it for a while. Then the men from Caesarea that Cornelius had sent to come and get Peter, they show up. God doesn't make. There's some guys at the gate wanting to see you. I sent them to go with them and go without doubting. Don't argue these things with yourself. Take it and go. Okay, well, what happens? Well, to paraphrase, because, again, a lot of repetition, because Peter shows up and he asks Cornelius, hey, what's all this about? And Cornelius said unto him, well, one day I was praying, I was fasting, and about the ninth hour of the day I saw a vision. Angel came down, told me to call for Peter down to Joppa. And he said, so I sent my men down, and then they came and they fetched you, and then now you're here. That's what it was. Okay, then we can, verse number 25, and as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Peter took him up and said, hey, whoa, 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 stand up. I myself am also a man. He's saying, I'm nobody special. I'm a man, not an angel, not the Lord. And we know we shouldn't bow down and worship angels. Right, the only thing that we should worship, God. But see, Cornelius, although he feared God, he was still a little new to this apostle thing. He hadn't been around the church in Jerusalem. He's from Caesarea. But he had heard about God at some point, the true God. We don't find him bowed down and worshiping Jupiter or Mercury or any of the other ones, which that's what they mistook Paul for, was Jupiter, because he didn't say much. Or no, wait, the other way around. They mistook Paul for Mercury because he was the one doing all the talking. They said, surely that's the messenger of the God. Not, not Cornelius. He knew who God was, but he thought maybe this is someone that God had sent. Maybe this is a messenger from God. He doesn't know what to do. It's, he just falls on his face and says, you know, you're, you're God's messenger. Now certainly we should show reverence to those that God has put in our life to bring us the message of God, but we're not to worship him. And we could get into a whole lesson about how people who worship pastors end up getting hurt. Now should the pastor have done most of those things that hurt them people? No. But it also wasn't right according to the Bible to put those people on such a high pedestal we should esteem them for their work's sake but we are not to esteem them above anybody else we're going to see that here in a second but Cornelius tells his story of why he sent for Peter okay, then Peter in verse number 34 opened his mouth and said of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons but in every nation, he that feareth them and worketh righteousness is accepted with them. The word of God, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. The word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem who they slew and hanged on a tree him God raised up the third day and showed him openly not to all people but unto witnesses chosen before God even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead well what did we gain out of those verses well this is the message that Peter was delivered unto Caesarea to deliver 
unto Cornelius. He's saying, well, I know why I'm here. He says, you want to hear about Jesus. He says, you've heard a little bit about him. Because look, that word I say, ye know, in verse number 37, was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee. What's that mean? From the time that Jesus was baptized of John and the River Jordan, and we heard about it on Wednesday night, heaven opened up, spirit descended as a dove upon him, there was the voice from heaven, this is my son, beloved son in whom I am well pleased. From that moment, the word went out all over about Jesus. That this guy was something special. Now Cornelius had heard that. At some point he had been introduced to either Jesus or God because he worshipped God. We found that in verse number 1. Doesn't say he was worshipping false. He had heard bits and pieces but he didn't know all of it. That's why God told him to send for Peter. He says, Peter will fill you in on the rest. That was everything else that we read. Because although he had heard the beginning of it, that it started in Galilee, Peter, by the time we got down to verse number one, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. He's saying, there are some that know the whole story, and I'm one of them. He says, I've been delivered here to give you the whole story. Because Cornelius didn't know what he needed. He just knew that God told him to send for Peter. He knew that God knew what he needed. And God said Peter needed to show up. Okay, now, great story. I mean, we can find that, you know, in, uh, as we read that when Peter came in, talked to him. Okay, but before that, Peter went down in verse number 21 to the men which were sent unto him for, from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause? Wherefore ye are come. And they said, Cornelius is a centurion, a just man, and one that feared God, and of a good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words for thee. Now, when they were eventually come into his house, in verse number 24, and the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and hath called together his kinsmen and near friends. It wasn't just Cornelius that Peter was going to preach to. A whole bunch of people. Okay, then, Peter, we read verse 26, don't stand up, I'm a man, don't worship me. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many that were come together. It's more than just Cornelius. Then, Peter in verse number 28 said, And he said unto them, Ye know how that, is un how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Now there's a lot in that verse. But the message that Peter had to deliver, it was to many people. Now, I'm convinced that God would have told Peter to go and would have told Cornelius to send for Peter if Cornelius was the only one that would have heard. God had worked it out to where Philip walked by that Ethiopian eunuch one day. We don't find anybody else in that chariot with the Ethiopian, but God sent Philip. Right? Likewise, I believe that God would have worked it out for Philip, but Cornelius called everybody that he knew. Everybody that would come. Hey, come over to my house. Man of God's coming. Now, all those people that are in that house, they're in there, they're waiting. Because it said when Peter entered in, there were many. They were already there. They were waiting for Cornelius' men to come back with Peter. It says it took him a day. It said on the morrow when they entered in. Well, what are we working towards? If Peter would have kept doubting the vision that God showed him, not to call it anything common or unclean. If he would have held that, he never would have gone into that house. He never would have gone in and taught all those people that were waiting on him. And let's be honest. If you had been waiting for a day for a guy to show up, and he gets there and he says, no, no, no I can't go in there. You all got to come out to me. How many of us, keep in mind, they're unsaved, in the flesh would have said you know what forget this guy 
He thinks he's better than us. Cornelius is a centurion. Now, Cornelius' men, we just read it in verse number 22, was a just man of a good report among all the Jews. He did right by those people that he had been given charge over, but he was a leader. He was a ruler. He had at least 100 men under his command, which is why they're called a centurion. But sometimes those uh, groups could go up to, into the thousands. One centurion could be given command over. He had men. He had sway. Rome entrusted this part of Rome's kingdom or domain to this guy. So they had faith in his ability to keep things in control, to be the leader, the ruler of the area. So some of the people that he called might have been very influential. Might have been wealthy. But what do we likely know about all of them? They're Gentiles. In order to be a centurion, Cornelius had to be a Roman citizen. Doesn't mean that he was born in Rome. But it does mean that at some point, he was born into the Roman Empire. He was a Roman citizen. I mean, Paul was the same way. He was a Roman citizen, even though he was Jewish. But we know that he was a Roman. We know that he's in Caesarea. Nowhere do we find that he was a Jewish man. In fact, because of the vision that God gave Peter, all these people were Gentiles. And then later it says they were all Gentiles. But if Peter would have said, no, I can't go in there. You guys got to come out to me. These influential people would have said, this guy's a fisherman. We can tell by the way he's dressed. And the fishermen's telling us to come out and meet him. But what was the vision that God showed Peter? Not to call anything common or unclean. That's what he told them. Because under the law, a Jewish man could not enter into the house of a foreign person or of a Gentile. In fact, here, we'll give you another example. Anybody that was a Gentile, anything that they touched became unclean. It became tainted. Some things would even be tainted if a Jewish person touched it and they hadn't gone through all the proper sacrifices and prayers and purifications. For instance, if you weren't one of the Levites and you were to touch the candlestick or the menorah, as we would call it nowadays, in the temple, if you weren't a Levite, that would defile it before God and they'd have to repurify it and recleanse it according to the law that God gave to the Jews. Well, likewise, a Gentile, if it's a Gentile's house, that's an unclean place. Because that's tainted by things that God said weren't holy. Peter told God, I'm not going to eat of that stuff, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean because that's what you told me to do. He's saying, I've kept that part of the law. He's not saying I'm perfect, but he's saying, I've never eaten any of this stuff I'm not supposed to. Well, likewise, Peter never went into a Gentile's house. Now, all the people that we find throughout the New or the gospel. Who was Zacchaeus? He was a Jewish tax collector. Jesus said, I'm going into your house today. Now the centurions that called for Jesus, did he ever go into their houses? Mm -hmm. What was the rebuke from the Pharisees? Not that he went into unclean places, but that he was the friend of publicans and sinners. See, Jesus had to fulfill the law. He could not have fulfilled the law if he would have broken the law. So here, for the first time, Peter's been given a commandment. Hey, I fulfilled it. Don't worry, but you're not under the law anymore. Go to those that want to hear about me. But see, Peter at first thought it was about the food. He didn't get the greater implication until he got there. He's saying, oh, the food was the example. I haven't eaten unclean food, but I also haven't ever been into a Gentile's house before. He said, I've never gone into a centurion's house, let alone a Gentile's house. That would, under the law, have defiled him. He would have had to have gone and made sacrifices for that. He would have had to have cleansed himself before God. But when he got there, Peter made a point of pointing it out to show them that hey, it's not my will that I'm here today. God worked all this out. He's saying, used to, before I met Jesus, or really just before two days ago, I wouldn't have come into this house. 
But God's shown me something. He's shown me no man is common or unclean. In other words, he got to look in it. It says all men are a four-footed beast. There could have been something in there that Peter might have been able to eat. But because they were associated with other unclean things, can't, can't have them. All of it's unclean. If there had been one Jewish person in that house, under the law, they would have been defiled, waiting on Peter to show up. Peter's saying, whether you're Jew, Gentile, we're all filthy in the eyes of God before Jesus. Now, I ran across a book, haven't had time to read it yet, but the title caught my attention. It's called Peter the Bible Corrector. Peter the Bible Corrector. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus said, hey, these men are going to arrest me, take me to Calvary. Not so, Lord. If they take you, I'm going with you. They're going to have to go through me first. Here, rise, Peter, kill, eat. Not so, Lord. How many times in his young Younger life. He wasn't young, but he was younger. Did Peter say, not, not so, Lord? No. I've always done it this way. In fact, he had always done it that way because it had been God's will up to that point. But he's saying, nope. You're not going to the cross. You're supposed to set up your millennial reign. I thought we were all going to get thrones out of this deal. Well, one day they will. They're going to be part of them four and twenty elders. They're going to have a throne, round about the throne of Christ. But, just like here, Peter didn't get the whole picture at first. And we're just as guilty. Don't be looking down at Peter. But a lot of times, Peter, not so, Lord. God brought it down out of heaven and told you, rise. No. Can't do that, Lord. Because you told me I couldn't. Well, no. God told you you couldn't show you that there was a difference between holy and unholy and now you've been made holy through the blood of Jesus Christ he's saying there's no barrier for you to go and do these things anymore your sins have been forgiven so go tell them sinners how to be saved but what was the problem Peter had to kill off a part of himself in that day's journey between the time that he received this and God said go without doubting Peter had to kill off that part of himself get rid of what he used to be what he was holding on to because let's really break down in this time period what was going on with the Jews you remember the Pharisees they conducted themselves and demanded respect from other people because they thought that they were holier than others because they supposedly kept more of the law. But Jesus pointed out many occasions that, nope, the woman who gave two mites gave more than everybody else there that day. The ones that pray aloud in the synagogue so that everybody can hear them, they have their reward. But the sinner that was in the temple smiting himself on the chest, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. He's the one that walked out having actually done business with God. But in this time period... Jews thought that they had to keep these things because it made them better than the Gentiles. They were trying to earn their association with God. They knew that God had called them, called them his chosen people. And they thought they had to do something in order to merit that. We have to be better than others. But they lost the focus of what the law was really there to show you that, no, you're not all that special. But God showed you grace and mercy anyway. That even though, because if, if they'd have been able to keep it, why'd they have to still make sacrifices? Why'd they still have to give a sin offering? Why? Because they weren't perfect. But some of them thought they were. And I'm not saying that's what Peter thought, but that's what other people in this day and age were used to seeing from Jewish people. Why do you think the woman at the well said, Thou being a Jew, asketh me for something to drink? Why? Because under the law, not only that thing that she used to draw the water up, but also the water became contaminated or unclean because a Samaritan or a half-breed had touched it. But Jesus took it to water anyway. It was Jacob's well. God gave it to Jacob. 
but that's a whole nother lesson. We're not going to get on that. But the point is, Peter had to get past something. So with that thought, we're just going to teach on this morning. What are you holding on to? Peter was holding on to the law even though he was under grace. He's saying, I have to do these things or I'm not going to be right with God. And God showed him, no, Peter, it's those things that are keeping you from doing exactly what I want you to do. Peter was holding on to the fact that if I don't do this, God's going to think that I don't, you know, I'm not worthy of him anymore. But Jesus didn't ask him, Peter, are you worthy? He said, no, 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 Peter, do you love me? He's saying, you were never worthy. You were never clean because you were still under the bonds of sin. Once Peter realized what he thought was keeping him right with God really wasn't all that important, or what he thought he should be, wasn't what God wanted him to be when he let go of that, later on you find that not only do these people get saved, okay, it says, verse number 44, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision. Who's that? That's the Jews. Which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost they didn't just get saved they got in all the way in wasn't a head knowledge this is a heart knowledge and up to this point the 120 in the upper room that had the Holy Ghost poured out on them on the day of Pentecost you know who they were they weren't Gentiles they were Jews Everybody up till this point who had received the Holy Ghost, where were they at? Most of them in Jerusalem. Where were they teaching and preaching? In the temple. Well, who goes in there? Jews. Gentiles weren't allowed to go. You know, they would defile things if they touched them in there. There was a place for them in the very outer court, but that was outside the building. They couldn't enter in. So this is the first recorded instance that we have the Gentiles got in, but not only that, God poured out the Holy Ghost on them. You find that some of them even had some spiritual gifts of speaking in tongues. But what was that? They were speaking in a language that they didn't know, where they were speaking in their language, but then they were people that were listening to it were hearing it in a different language. Right? They weren't speaking a whole bunch of nonsense. But they marveled at it, the Jews, because they said, wow, God really can do everything. Some of them up to this point thought that only Jewish people could get in. God's showing them different. Because they were holding on to that separation that kept them away from everybody else. That's the first thing that you hold on to. If it's not something that God's given you to hold on to, if it's something that you've decided, it's going to separate you from the ones that God wants you to win. I'll give you an example. What did Jonah hold on to? He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He liked it where he was. But he said, well, if I can't have this, I'll go the opposite direction. I'll go to Tarshish, or however you say it. He was saying, I'm going to hold on to my independence from Nineveh. I don't want to go there. Now, granted, Nineveh, wicked place. So I got one to send him there. But he said, I'm not going to them people. He was holding on to his separation from us. Lord, I may not be perfect, but I'm not as wicked as them. They don't deserve you. I'm not going. I don't want to go down. They might kill me before I even get into the city. Ignoring the entire time that God said, go. What did God tell Peter? Go. Well, Peter went. At least Peter was listening. Took Jonah three days in the belly of a fish in order to figure out that, yeah, I'll go. But what are we holding on to? Well, sometimes it's things that I want. Things that I thought God wanted me to do. Or maybe things that God hadn't spoken to me, but that's what I had my heart set on. Right now, I'll never forget. Brother Charlie ran me a copy. I've still got it somewhere. First message I preached was, when God changes our direction. Those Israelites coming out of Egypt, they wanted to take the short route. Moses said, Lord, that's not going to work. There are a whole bunch of great armies over there. We've been in captivity for a whole long time. Hundreds of years. And we don't know how to fight or to defend ourselves. And God said, I know. That's why we're going this way. 
led them around all the things that would have destroyed them or been too much for them. Well, sometimes the thing that I'm holding on, well, God, I know how to get from A to B, and it's over there. God says, that's not the only way. But until I let go of my map or my directions or what I thought would have been best for me, until I let go of that, I'm separated from where God actually wants me to be. I'm not separated under Christ. I'm separated away from Christ. The Jews thought that doing these things made them more holy, got them closer to God. God showing Peter, the thing that you can do to be closest to God is do what God tells you. Sometimes God will tell you to do something that you thought, but God had never asked me to do that. Why? He's an almighty, omnipotent God. If he tells you to do it, he can do it. It's just up to us. Why did Peter say, not so, Lord? Because he thought God couldn't make those things clean. That's why God spoke to him afterwards and says, hey, don't call unclean what God has cleansed. If God provides it, if there's a way to do it, it's not unclean anymore. Is he telling Peter to go out and sin? No. He didn't tell Peter to go out and commit adultery or anything like that. He's saying, what separated you from the Gentiles before is no longer there. That was the law. I mean, we can go back to the book of Malachi where Malachi prophesied that God would have, you know, b believers, followers. He would call out among many nations and all nations those that would become his followers. Well, how's that going to happen? Somebody that isn't in those nations has to go tell them people. Well, Peter went. Followers came out of Caesarea. One of them being a Roman centurion that was in charge of an entire band. But see, up until that point, Peter's personal convictions, not scriptural, personal, kept him separated from the people that God wanted to send him to. Peter had to let go of it, had to kill that part. He had to turn not so, Lord, into, yes, Lord. Okay. And at first, it may not make sense. For a day's journey, Peter's thinking, why in the world am I going with these Gentiles to another Gentile's house? Until they opened the door, and then Peter looked past Cornelius and said, oh, they're waiting to hear about Jesus. Why do you think he said, down in verse number 34, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. He's saying, I get it now. It wasn't just about the animals, it was about the people. He's saying, if God knows that there's somebody who wants to hear about him, Cornelius was doing his best, but he didn't know the whole of it. He was praying to God. He feared God, but he didn't know what it took to be a member of the family of God. So he sent Peter. Well, sometimes it's what I want. Sometimes it's where I want to go. But in every instance that we can find in the Bible, it's not something that's unscriptural, because we all know that's not the will of God for you to do that. But it's something that we desire or that we cling to that when God says, let it go, there are instances of people that did let it go and those that didn't. And it always turns out the same way. If you let go of what you desire, God's going to get the glory for it. If you don't, you're either going to suffer chastisement or God's going to find somebody else to go do it instead. People make the mistake of saying that Paul was the first missionary to the Gentiles. Well, Peter's the one that went first. Went down to Caesarea. Now, he didn't go to Antioch and he didn't go to Thessalonica and to Rome and all these other places where churches were started. But the one that God showed it to first, Peter. And I mean, Brother, Brother Doug Harold preached on it a couple Sundays ago that if you don't think that Peter was the leader of the apostles in the early church, then you, you're reading a different Bible than the one that I lead. That's why he was always speaking up, because they looked to him to speak. They did follow after him. So why did he show it to Peter first so that Peter could go and tell the rest of them, hey, I'm not going to believe what God did. It says that Peter brought them with him to come back and teach a few of them. And they were all in awe. That, yeah, these, these really are Gentiles, but they got the Holy Ghost on them. 
They're in the Spirit of God. But see, what's the difference between holding on to something that will separate us unto God and something that will separate us away from what God wants us to do? Now see, up until this point, I firmly believe Peter been preaching. I mean, we can go back a couple of chapters. They healed a lame man in the temple. Right? That's after the day of Pentecost. That guy's jumping, leaping, praising God around. They get, him and John get beat. They're told, hey, don't ever talk about Jesus again. Well, here we are in chapter 10. What's Peter still doing? Preaching about Jesus. I firmly believe he's smack dab in the will of God, and then this comes up. But the thing that separates those things that we're holding on to, that God doesn't want us to hold on to, and firm convictions that we do need to hold on to, is God's never going to bring up something that you're doing right and say, hey, you got to let go. God's never going to bring up, hey, you need to stop reading your Bible. Hey, you need to stop praying. Hey, you need to stop witnessing. Because see, Peter still hadn't gotten it yet. What did Jesus tell him? The beginning of the book of Acts. And at the end of most of the Gospels. You should be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. He said, go and tell them. Well, some of them must have thought, well, there's a whole bunch of Jews out there that he wants us to go tell in all those areas. No, no, no. Uttermost parts of the earth. That means everybody. And Peter hadn't gotten over that mental block yet. So God told him, no, 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 no. When you go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other ones, it's not just to the Jews, Peter. Because Jesus did tell him to feed his sheep and to feed his lambs. Well, apparently Peter thought that those were just the Jewish people because they were God's chosen people. Those were his sheep. But he came into his own and his own received him not. So the Lord tells Peter, go to those that will receive me. God didn't bring up, Peter, you need to stop praying so much. Peter, you need to stop preaching all the time. Peter, you need to stop caring for those in the church. Because, I mean, we can go and look at how they divided. The apostles were over everything, then they had deacons that also would help them with the affairs of the day-to-day. But the apostles were the ones that gave the authority to give out the money to meet the needs of the people. He said, Peter, you need to stop caring for them people so much. No. But the thing that did bump up against what God wanted Peter to do, if God brings it before you and says, hey, we need to address this, something you need not hold on to. Or he may bring up something that you're loosely holding on to, and he's saying grab a hold tighter. But if God brings it up, and if the Holy Ghost starts convicting you about it, business needs to be done. It's not something you can ignore. Now, I don't know. We can't find that there's scripture on it. But I'm just saying maybe that God had been dealing with Peter about this a little bit. Maybe as he's walking to the temple one day, God's saying, look at all them people that don't know me, Peter. Look at all them Roman centurions. Keep in mind, who was it that crucified Christ? Centurions. Maybe every time Peter saw him, he thought, you might have been the one that hung him on the tree. And you know why Peter might have thought that? Because he wasn't there to see the ones that did. He wasn't at the cross. So maybe every time he sees one, he's got hate in his heart, and God's saying, let it go. Go witness to him. Amen. Now, Brother Jordan, how can you say that? Because I'm stubborn. And long before there's a buck stops here, and you've got to come face to face with God, he's been dealing with me for a while about it. I've been trying to ignore it. You just get caught up. Your mind gets on something different, and instead of doing business with a God, it keeps building and building until eventually you've got to come face to face with God one day and decide what you're going to do. God won't convict you about something that you're doing right. He'll bless you for it. Because what you're doing brings praise and honor unto God. But if God's dealing with you about it, it's something that needs to be addressed. Because to say, well... You know, I don't like it when they teach on that. I don't want to hear about that. I know that I'm doing the right thing. Well, how do you know that? 
Because if you're being convicted and you're saying, well, I'm already doing it right, you're saying that God's wrong. Because the Holy Spirit's just as all-knowing as God the Father and God the Son. The Holy Spirit's just as powerful as God the Father and God the Son. And the Holy Spirit that He gave to be our comforter, well, why does He comfort us? He comforts us in knowing that what we're doing is what God wants us to do. Or we take comfort in the fact that God loves us so much that He gave us one to stick closer to us than any friend or brother could. Because he's, he's sealing us until the day of redemption. He indwells us. He gave us somebody that close to us to show us when we're wrong so that we can be right with God. There's a great blessing in that. But if we ignore him, it's going to come to a moment where God says, Peter, there's people out there waiting. Go. Don't doubt. Peter would have doubted. He might have turned around and said, Nobody here named Peter. I'm Simon, but I don't, I don't have the surname Peter. What would have happened? Well, I'd like to believe that God in His grace would have sent somebody else down to Cornelius. But God knew that Peter would go. That's why He told him to send for Peter. He knew that Peter wasn't where he needed to be, but that Peter would be by the time that those men showed up because God was going to do business with him. We can look to other people who didn't. One of them, Barnabas. Barnabas was used mightily of God for a time. He went with Paul. Everywhere Paul went, Barnabas went. On all those missionary journeys. Now, we find that the Apostle Paul could talk really loud and for a long time, one time he preached so long that a guy fell asleep and fell out a window. Okay? Paul could deliver the mail, but we do find that sometimes Barnabas is helping the Apostle Paul when it came to preaching and when it came to ministering. What if the Apostle Paul's preaching? Who's going to deal with all those people that maybe are under conviction and don't know what to do? Well, as Paul's preaching, Barnabas might have been over there in the corner telling people how to get saved. Barnabas might have been the one that was baptizing after the people got saved while Paul was still preaching. But he was used mightily ago. But then one day he split from the Apostle Paul. It was right after the apostles had this great debate on the issue of circumcision. And we can go and study it out. There were those of the believers that thought, well, in order to really be saved, you have to be circumcised also. Show me where Peter taught that to Cornelius and all these people. He didn't, because God didn't tell him to. And then later on we find that after they hash it out, all the apostles said, you know what? They're right. Don't need to be. That's a work of the flesh. That's a work of the law. There's no merit in that as far as God's concerned for spirituality. God wouldn't have saved them if God still needed them to do something. But, well, that kind of rubbed Barnabas the, the wrong way, especially when Barnabas wanted to bring John Mark with him. And Paul said, nope, he left us before, he'll leave us again. There was a rift there. And instead of getting it right with God, Barnabas said, okay, Paul, see you later. That's when Silas comes into the picture. But well, that was something that God was dealing with. That he didn't, there was something there that he didn't let go of. So what are we holding on to? Oh, wow. I'm really late. What are we holding on to? What's the thing that we keep saying, well, I can, I can do this and still do what God wants me to do. I can still keep to this and be what God wants me to be. I don't know what it is. I'm not the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost, if he's dead, you know what it is. And all of us at some point have had that moment where the Holy Ghost says, you need to do this, you need to let go of this, you need to start doing this. Amen. And truthfully, if you're growing in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, if you're growing in grace and you've weaned off of the milk and you're on the meat, in order to keep growing, you're going to have to keep letting go of more and more things. If Peter never would have let go of this, Peter would only preach to Jews for the rest of his life. Still could have been preaching, still could have been, you know, same gospel. But as a result, Peter lost out on a whole lot of a reward in heaven. Because imagine how many people this leader of the Roman government could have told about Jesus. And I can't prove it, but there is documented that back in the early days, right after Jesus 
passed away, there was an entire Roman battalion that had some name that meant the believers of Jesus or Christians. An entire company of people that were saved serving in the Roman army. I can't prove it to you, but maybe, just maybe, all them fellows ran into a guy named Cornelius one day. Had the Italian band, and he said, yep, you can join up with us. There's just one requirement. You ever met a man named Jesus? Wouldn't have happened if Peter wouldn't have gone. Paul never would have gone to any of those other places if he held to all those things that made him righteous under the law as a Pharisee. Because when Paul detailed all those things, that under the law he was, you know, the Jew, was, the Jew of the Jews kept it all, did everything that they told him to do thinking they wouldn't make him holy. He said, I let go of all that one day on the road to Dam Damascus. I ran into someone that I saw and I said, nope, he's holy and I'm not, even in all the things I'm doing. Paul wouldn't have let go of that. He would have gone to Damascus. He would have persecuted them Jews because he didn't let go of those things that kept him separated from what God wanted him to be. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.